Now, the thing with Tim O'Leary, if he's in it for the right reasons, there's other people involved in that foundation. That money will still be released. Yeah. It's not about Tim O'Leary. I think Tim O'Leary wants it about Tim O'Leary. And yeah. it'll be interesting to see where that 250 grand gone. Mayo County Board, good luck, Tim O'Leary. I'm not finished yet. It took me a long time to get here. Both parents have, have spoken with each other. So we have Donald Keoghan on the show today, lads. He's coming up in part two. He was at the announcement of the Allianz League sponsorship has been extended for another five years. That's going to bring Allianz up to 2025, which all on the face of it looks good. But when I read this, I was thinking, what the hell is supposed to happen to my championship restructure, which is bringing the league into the summer, which will no longer be the league then. It's going to be the championship. So this is supposed to happen. This is supposed to be voted on at an emergency congress later this year. So why are they doing a deal for another five years? Like, OK, so here's the thing that really annoys me. The CPA have pull, pulled out of negotiations with this um, committee that was formed to restructure the championship. And they pulled out on the basis that they think that the GEA have no intentions of changing anything and that they want the status quo to stay as it is. So the optics of this are terrible, lads. Like if the GA and like I actually believe John Horan wants change. Why are they doing a deal with Allianz now instead of after next September when we know exactly what we're, go- what we're dealing with for the next five years? Like, I mean, it's really annoying because before the broadcast, the broadcast deal was done for five years and the following year they started the Super 8s. So there's a whole load more games. Then the broadcasters didn't want to put provincial matches on the television because they wanted the Super Ace games. And it was a whole mess. The hurling championship changed into a monster uh, and into a league. Loads more matches. And they had an old existing broadcast deal. Now they're getting five more years with Allianz as a league. When fingers crossed, I would love for the league to be no more the following year and it to be the actual championship. Does it mean then that the league won't be called the league if it's moved to the summer it can't and that Allianz have had any sponsorship of any competition that exists in the spring? Well, Allianz will deal. still have the Hurling League, which is, you know, anyway, but I'd, I'd make an argument to say that the Hurling League is obsolete because we, the Hurling Championship is a league and the Hurling League now is a terrible waste of time because all it is is a secondary league before a really good league. Do you know what I mean? And I'm the only one giving out about that because Hurling pundits generally don't complain about stuff. But like, I mean, they've obviously have... Pro- provisions with Allianz based on what might happen. My thoughts on this though is, Jerry, why, why announce it now? Why not just wait to see what, what happens? It's probably classic GEA in my view. That's what, what I the, think. Yeah, the car before the horse. Uh, Allianz, if they're putting uh, bread on the table, they're, they're, they're not the only going into the dark. You can be sure that they probably know what's going on. Yeah. Uh, or what's due to happen or most likely to happen. And See, what could happen? See, this is the thing. So I was trying to think what would happen. This is just with football because Hurling, right, as of now, they'll still sponsor the Hurling League. Say if the Football League is flipped and it becomes the Championship, is the provision that they have to pay an awful lot more going forward because it's obviously the Championship then and it's worth an awful lot more money? is the provision that the, the league sponsorship, is, it, the contract is null and void after a year, which would be a really bizarre kind of thing to do. Is it a situation that if the provincials are moved early in the year and the championship is based on a league, that Allianz transfer over their sponsorship to the provincials part? You know what I mean? It, it's such a messy negotiation mm. now rather than what it would be in October when they know exactly what to talk about. Well, Allianz Sorry, are from... No, go on, no, go on. <laughs> no, I was just no, going to say that they definitely, won't be, they definitely won't be cancelling the contract after a year, you know, having already agreed a provision for five years. Yeah. Uh, you'd like to think that provisions have been made, but as you said, you would have thought the provisions would have been made for the, cha- the biggest changes in both football and hurling championships going back probably a generation. Wait. And the broadcast deal <laughs> seems the same. But the only thing I'd say is that the, the, the existing relationship between Allianz and the GA goes back so long that you'd... You know, I think it's like 25 years, possibly even yeah. more, that you'd trust that there's parties there that, you know, because the relationship has gone on for so long that they have provisions made for what will happen down the line. But Yeah, no, I'm sure they have provisions. I'm just thinking what messy, how many provisions do they need? I'm after listing off a few <laughs> potential <laughs> provisions there. And like, I mean, what kind of a negotiation is this? Because they have championship sponsors. Centre and Super Value um, are there. And isn't it, I think Centre and Super Value are there until 2022. Um so, like, I mean, that's a mess as well. You know, you, I suppose um, Allianz can't go across and just become championship sponsors all of a sudden because you have other championship sponsors under contract. And it's just, to me, it looks like a mess and they could have waited. Of course, it could have waited. But again, I'll just say it, not to repeat myself, it is classic GA. They tend to just push through, th- uh, tr- push things through. Um, the different departments in there, the, the commercial department would have their strategy. 
and their vision and they're obviously coming to towards the end of that deal and it is important to try and get a new one in place the guts of a year before the uh, current one runs out so I'd say that's just what they're thinking and they're not overly bothered maybe in, in uh, um, with what the guys on the Central Council are going to do in terms of reorganising fixtures that they're just throwing behind it but if uh, your alliance if they're sponsoring the Hurling League uh, as it stands and then they're coming to the summer and then obviously the football league is on the summer well they they just get extended exposure in a way I suppose yeah but I, I, look we don't really know we don't really no. know what it is I just I do accept keeping a sponsor and having geez, a year in advance is a little bit much for me like in September you're still giving yourself four months and like there is a good partnership there I just I think the optics aren't good and I think that the championship restructure of the league flipping into the championship can't be in their thoughts if they're too much. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Which it's my favorite. Um, it's my favorite restructure because it's mine, and I'm a little bit dis- <laughs> I'm I'm a little bit disappointed with it. And I did ask somebody in the GA yesterday for clarification about what happens, and he wouldn't give it to me. Um, he was a bit annoyed about. I tweeted about this yesterday, and I said it looks like they're making it up as they go along. And he, he pretend he preferred to talk about the tweet and than actual giving me clarification for the show today. So, like, I mean, I don't think that helps anything either. Like, you know, I said, tweet is one thing, but I want to have a proper line for the actual yeah, show. Yeah. Said I get things wrong on Twitter all the time or whatever. And I got a lecture about Twitter use rather than give me a, <laughs> rather than give me, right. rather than give me a line, which that's disappointing yeah. as far as I'm but, concerned. But it is like, I know, Merta in there, going back to the Lance Armstrong stories and the cyclists where you, you, there was a silence. You, you said nothing in terms of what you've seen. But it's like the designs in Crow Park as well and working in GA as well, it can become quite frustrating where you're asking these simple questions like you just asked yesterday. Yeah. Like, so what is the plan? What is the vision? And they, I don't think they know. And that, But that's, the, that's what they're criticised a lot for, not yeah. having a long-term vision, yeah, not yeah. seeing yeah. what's coming. What yeah. is, what's the GA structure, sponsorship, uh, broadcasting rights going to look like in five years' time? I'd say they, might, they wouldn't know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, which is crazy stuff. And you'd imagine that this restructure now is going to be a long-term restructure. So based on what's decided in September, let's start negotiating based off what we're going to see for five years rather than let's, you know, oh, stop yeah. listening. She could talk about it all day. <laughs> it is crazy stuff. Michael Murphy um, has been talking about that second yellow card. And like, I mean, he said, I was trying to get up the field. Like, this is fairly obvious to what happened. I was trying to get up the field and the two of us went down. And then all of a sudden, probably because of the length of time we we're in the shemazel, I appreciate the use of the word shemazel, there's always going to be two yellow cards, uh, but it is what it is. You're going to get that in football. Two teams going at it, two players going at it. It was frustrating and disappointing. We need to learn from it and move on. So, like, I mean, Michael Murphy's not going crazy about this. Michael Murphy would do the same thing mm. if he was in John Small's position, as would any of the Donegal defenders do it. Nobody's necessarily blaming John Small for not want, for trying to stop Michael Murphy getting down to support an attack. The problem, don't hate the players, hate the game. It's Is fair, that it? It's a fair point, and obviously I watched the match. Um, I listened to your review show with Rekir McKeever earlier on the week in Connell, and Michael Murphy's comments there. I, I think Michael was kind of diplomatic probably in his comments there he's probably trying to deflect from it um, in ways because he is still playing and he wants to concentrate on, on, the, on the football and, uh, and going into next week's games but I'm sure he's extremely frustrated with, with uh, what's happened and I know we've looked at the Clifford incident then as well we talked about that too um, I think it's a cop out from the referees to send off the uh, forward or the guy who uh, wasn't instigating it. Um, now, if the guy who was being tackled swings out and throws a punch, well, then fair enough. I suppose you can't do that either. But if he's just it's been pulled to the ground, I think the referees or the sideline officials need to give more support. In the all ref. their defence, these things often happen off the ball. Yeah. Where it's very hard to see the exact. Often, when with the cameras, they'll pan on it when it's already flared mm. up, like in, on Air Sport the other night. Mm. Nobody saw the start on any camera angle so it is difficult you to find that in it. I think if in doubt don't give two yellows talk to them yeah. if there's no punches thrown what's the big odds you don't know what happened you don't know how it started give them a warning the game's nearly over yeah. do you know yeah. Like it, yeah. maybe the two yellows no yellows at all is the solution here yeah 
Well, Michael Murphy to me sounded like a guy who just didn't want to be part of a headline this week. Yeah, to is it, be, yeah. Be comments yeah. And like, like but Michael Murphy knows the game, though, course, Connor. Yeah. See, that's, he can't cry about that when he'd be championing a defender <laughs> yeah. for doing yeah, that. Yeah, like yeah. like Murphy moves on from yellow card controversy, doesn't sell headlines uh, and, and doesn't sell papers. Michael Murphy knows that, but just the the way he describes it is the way that it's being dealt with at the moment. That like you know, no matter how, if you're involved, you're going to get a yellow card. Like you know, and that's that's the problem. That's the prevailing attitude, and that's the problem. But as you said. When you're not, when in doubt, why, why the need to actually give a yellow for something that it was, you know, I'd say it became clear fairly quickly that there was no punches thrown, bar a little bit of pushing and shoving, then listen, get over it. And then what that does is to detract for the need for the likes of John Small who might have inscaled the last there, Ben McDonald. Well, if nobody's going to get a yellow, well then, you know, I don't need to inscale it. In the That's it, yeah. Pushing and, and shoving. And uh, you always remember back to the All-Ireland final, Pat McEnany, the, the, the best referee probably had while I was playing, um, in 1996 where he sent off Liam McKay oh. and Colin Coyle <laughs> if you remember <laughs> yeah, yeah, his yeah. best thing there to do was to do nothing mm. there were so many lads like you could literally send off seven or eight fellas yeah. do nothing yeah. and do they can know, still do the review time, afterwards you can and, do and the review suspend whoever you want suspend, but yeah. when these shamozzles happen happen it's just guesswork by a referee isn't it really yeah. like there's so many lads piling in David, David Coldrick uh, maybe the semi-final in the All-Ireland 2010 against Cork uh, which we lost um I was God, I, was, I, should, I should remember that. Is it Pierce, the big lanky fella from uh, Pierce O'Neill? Pierce O'Neill, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I was doing to him what probably Smalley was doing to uh, 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 Michael Murphy the weekend, you know. And I got booked, and I says, "What about your man?" And he had a swing on me, and he says, "Well, I doubt he started it," is what he said, you know. Who, which referee uh, was that? David, David Cold. Very was, good. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, "Yeah, I can appreciate that." <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and get on then, you know. But yeah. uh, but that's what the referee should probably do. But yeah, it doesn't happen yeah. that often. You see, that was probably just a pull, and he swung back. Did you mm. get him to the ground? If you got them to the ground, you see, that's when they both get the yellows. Yeah, yeah, when you yeah. started we into a wrestling match, far, probably, yeah. Yeah, 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 you yeah, needed yeah. to bring him down. Yeah. You see, but it won that year. Yeah, that's that's exactly what is. But it is. It's definitely an interesting one and I think enough of a light has been sh- shone on it now because we know listen it's been going on a long time where you're trying to catch up with the play and someone's trying to pull you back and it's very difficult to know what to do we see players the whole time now which it's driving me up the wall and Kieran Kilkenny's lethal for it there's loads of players lethal for it but he's kind of examples stick out where Ryan McHugh's trying to get up with the play and he's just turning around facing him and he's pushing yeah, him in the chest yeah. Boys, imagine how frustrating that must be. Yeah. Like, I'm sure you've done it, Cheryl. Like, oh, yeah. I mean, because they all done it. Lee Keegan always yeah. good for that too. Lee Keegan yeah. always does that with Connolly. Yeah. yeah, pushing him back. Yeah. I don't know if I'd have the patience yeah. to be able to put up with that because it's hard enough on your legs to be trying to catch mm. up on the play. Never mind, try and run, get a push, a good heavy push into your chest. Yeah. What's the, what's the forward to do in a situation for, like that? Yeah, and again, that is part of the game. So the It forward, shouldn't be though. Linesmen should stop that. Linesmen should stop that. And if Kieran or someone, again, everyone does it, is, is, is booked um, and the report of a linesman, well, then he has to be particularly careful because the second yellow and yeah. he, he's gone. In the forwards case, you just got to sidestep your man and get, get around him. Yeah. Uh, if it's a chance to um, catch him with something as you're going past, and no one sees that's what I would probably do as well and tough love like, you that's know, the thing yeah, that's yeah, the, only, yeah. the only thing is li- you it's, literally you have to stand up for yourself stand yeah. up for yourself yeah. wasn't it very interesting what McKeever said about Michael Murphy saying yeah. that we used to bully yeah. him was yeah. it? Yeah. number yeah. one yeah. wasn't it very honest for Kieran to admit that look yeah. obviously bully players on the field which is fair enough we, knew, we yeah. knew, knew that was the case and that goes on in most counties but then Michael Murphy just took it and I was listening to this going like feeling a little bit embarrassed because when anyone would be at me I'd go hey ref <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but you know you'd be slagging your mates forever in school and the fella that loses the head you keep going at him yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But if he doesn't do anything, you're like, ah, I'll go on to someone else. Like, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jesus, a complete another baby. I like. I'd imagine just how disrespectful they would have been thinking of me. What a baby this lad is, you know. But uh, yeah, no, it was definitely crossing my mind as he was saying it. Tim O'Leary, lads. My my uh, my <coughs> thoughts on this is that. Uh, good riddance to Tim O'Leary at this stage now because like I mean I was kind of half he, he's done a great job and co- going from being this really generous benefactor and everybody liking to thinking would this lad ever go away now mm. that's kind of the yeah. way I feel about him now um, it's uh, so like I mean he's preaching to the Mayo County Board and we all know these are amateurs giving up their free time and things are not run as well as potentially his company or you know mm. professional football clubs mm. etc now we all know that we're definitely on the side that they need to improve their standards. But like, I mean, here he's going whoring out. We're not very good. And a hashtag truth hurts. 
who does this lad think he is? Like, I mean, okay, you have a few beers on board. Jesus, you're not a you're not an also ran supporter. You're someone who's been dragging the Mayo County board over mm. the hot coals over money and demanding best practice. And you're <laughs> you're you're you, this fellow's been in Mayo dressing rooms, Connor. Yeah, like I saw a lot of talk kind of on Monday morning. First of all, I was kind of glad there was a bit of news about Mayo that detracted from the performance <laughs> in Monaghan. But there was a lot of talk about Mayo being the headlines again. It was been another embarrassing episode for Mayo. But like I think for, for, for once in a long time, the county board are to be commended because they took, yeah. like this tweet was sent on Sunday evening. There was a statement issued by the Mayo County Board on Monday morning, very brief, very to the point that we've ceased all dialogue with Tim O'Leary, explained that like they met, they sure they met last month, they met in January. They agreed upon a set of behaviours going forward that Tim, O'Gre- Tim O'Leary was happy with that all the clubs in the county were happy with it included conduct on social media I think something about exclusion of animosity Tim O'Leary was obviously in breach of this with the tweet like as you said like you know fair enough he's you know been a generous benefactor for Mayo but it doesn't give him the right to be making ridiculous knee jerk statements absolutely and, not and it's to, not the Premier League no, like, no, I, get I, out of it he's not Abramovich around. he doesn't own Mayo GEA and I think that's in a way might be what this where this lad's head's at yeah and, and like it's not as if like to be fair to Tim O'Leary at the very start of this process he did raise issues with governance in Mayo that like to, to be honest it was good that they were shining a light on yeah. but now that like that that was in the past and since then as you said people were getting a bit tiresome there was a lot of tweets a lot of tweets about you know he was he kind of revealed some confidential emails he kind of was taking the piss out of the um, receipts and stuff like that while you know it was a bit of a laugh for everyone for a while but it was like if you're on the Mayo County Board this was begin, beginning to get embarrassing in the statement that they issued last month after the they met with Tim O'Leary they said that it's been a difficult few months but we're happy to move forward and I would imagine at that case it was like right if this is if there's any other instances again we just cut ties with this guy that, that's that's what's happened Right okay and I, t- I I completely agree does he bring players around in his helicopter and has been in the dressing room He has done it? yeah I don't know about being in the dressing rooms but there's definitely pictures of him kind of uh, bringing some of the lads to events and stuff like that yeah. yeah, I've met him before I met him at the Great Debate where I took on Brolly Brolly was hanging out with him he was like he was Brolly's uh, drinking buddy for the night and they headed off then back to pub, some pub down the road um, drinking together he's an English fellow which I was surprised about like he's a strong English accent and I was yeah. thinking Jesus that's I, w- I wasn't expecting that you know when you I was thinking he's like an Irish American kind of fellow who just loves the GEA but there is a piece in the Daily Mail of him did you see this oh, I know about that one so yeah. it was in, in I didn't the, see it was in the was it, well, it was in the Euro, Euro 2012 Euro yeah. 2012 so there was an Italian penalty Italy were taking on England in the Euro tw- 2012 and Italy had a penalty and this fella's up on the terrace behind the goals so he pulled down his trousers, had the little fella shaking in the in the breeze, trying to put off the penalty taker. Like this fella's obviously a loose cannon, and he's, he's rich, he's rich, and suddenly everybody in the GA world has known about this lad. What? Like I mean, good luck, Tim. Now you oh, had my point. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't str- I wasn't blown away by him now, even that night. You know, yeah. like I mean, I don't know. I don't know. He's gone now, anyways, and that's it. That's that's the last we'll hear. The, yeah. the other point of this is there's two hundred fifty grand up for grabs here so this was money that hasn't been released to Mayo GA that's been fundraised by his foundation now the thing with Tim O'Leary if he's in it for the right reasons there's other people involved in that foundation that money will still be released it's not about Tim O'Leary I think Tim O'Leary wants it about Tim O'Leary and it'd be interesting to see where that 250 grand gone Mayo County Board good luck Tim O'Leary Tim O'Leary the question is now are you in it for yourself or are you in it for Mayo GA if you're in it for Mayo GA that money gets released by somebody else and thank you very much with a couple of conditions still conditions about how it's spent whatever that's all fine but if Tim O'Leary takes his football and goes home with it with the 250 yeah. grand yeah. that'll that'll really show what what he what he's all about I'd, I'd like to think he wouldn't but just I, I'm, I'm not sure does this relate to the 250 grand you're on about our other monies related to the foundation but he did say in the statement last month that a resolution has been reached and that the foundation money can now be released to Mayo GA in accordance with an email sent last April so I don't know does that relate to the 250 grand I think this is a new about? 250 grand okay well as you sure. said anyway because I know that um, again I keep coming back to this statement last month but they mentioned a trustee of the foundation uh, Terry Gallagher and that he was kind of instrumental in bringing the two parties together Tim O'Leary and Mayo GA to try and reach you know some sort of resolution because the dispute had been stretching back a long way so there are other people in that foundation that like you know will be hopefully acting in the best interest of Mayo GA as well and I would like to think that you know whatever about the tweet that Tim O'Leary is still about wanting to you know 
be in this for the benefit of Mayo GA yeah. as well. Sometimes so, I think crossed. I don't know. I, I know. I know. I wouldn't, I, I, be, I wouldn't be so sure. Do you know how lucky Dublin are? They just take the money off AIG and have none of this shit. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even have to fundraise over in over in New York or anything. But wouldn't that be a nice one for I, you? It'd be a nice little. Uh, earner for you like the Kerry yeah, lads every yeah. year head over yeah, to a yeah. dinner dance and get a trip and you know yeah, they fundraise yeah. that way but uh, you don't have to you don't you're have millionaires to. I'd say there's a few mad dubs now on the hill uh, pulling mooners and flashing <laughs> uh, <laughs> the are being taken you, know? you look up that article now <laughs> yeah. when you, when really you, when you go home, back yeah. so finally lads Shane McGullion I hope I've pronounced that right he's in the Irish news this week and he's talking about um, Fermanagh's style of play so he says we're trying to play with a quicker transition from defence to attack um, a lot of us haven't played that way with Fermanagh over the last while so mistakes are going to happen that's just the reality but the more we play it the more we practice these mistakes will get ironed out and hopefully we do the basics better Armagh will probably be thinking we'll drop back like we usually did but if we push out and put the pressure on them hopefully we'll get turnovers high up, higher up the pitch and get scores from it so like I mean isn't this just fantastic mm. this is on the back of Galloway's breathtaking attacking display last Sunday we have Fermanagh who I said was the black death last year <laughs> Turning around, pressing high up the field, moving the ball fast. No, and the game I, is turn. The game is turning, though, lads, and no. it might be two more years before it's really, really, really exciting. No, and and it is great, and it is it's certainly entertaining to watch uh, at inter county level. The players you're not worried about entertainment, and but you are worried about trying to enjoy uh, playing football. Like if you're just being told as a forward, and the way I suppose Galway were playing under uh, Kevin Mulch and under Mickey Hart for large parts of his tenure in charge. Uh, where you're dropping guys back the whole time, like they have serious footballers thrown. Guys have serious footballers. We've all said I've said it a few times last week. Let the lads go and play football, and listen to Kieran McKeever. I agree with everything he said last week. Um, on the on the on the Monday show, if you're if you're pushing up, putting the press in the opposition kick out, with the ball's coming down one wing, you're committing a few extra guys mm. there. Try to turn them over. Where the lads who aren't involved, you just took in a small bit to the side. And yeah, and if it's across with a ball or whatever, at least you have a bit of cover. But it's not a case of everyone turning their backs to the ball as it's being kicked out by the opposition and running back yeah. and taking up your spots which is probably what Jim McGuinness had the guys doing uh, that's the, that's effectively the, too that's, well, yeah. that's the difference because you think back to 2011 and you were still kicking the ball yeah. in I remember you doing yeah. it in probably too much in the first yeah. half but you were like you were completely sidelined by this yeah. but uh, by the extremity of it yeah. but this is the thing if a team like Donegal back then Fermanagh Carlo of recent years turn around and run back ahead of the ball and go back and wait there's no kicking game on there mm. there's none and uh, oftentimes for a couple of years teams are actually conceding kickouts just to be back there waiting there is no kicking game then it, it's impossible now that teams are all pressing mm-hmm. now there's a kicking game before they get back you know what I mean and the, the, the press and the kick out like that was obvious to me for the last three or four years, but it just takes so slow for these things to come around. And Galway was Galway will will expedite that because they were on television, and it's obvious that they were able to get the ball down the field faster than the Tyrone lads would filter back after their press. Yeah, and, and there you go; it's very obvious it now. Is, it is obvious. And the uh, kicking game works now better than the handpassing yeah. game almost. Well, Mayo were the ones who just kind of used that press uh, for me uh, a lot of the time against Dublin and. Um, uh, forcing clucks into into one or two errors and try to turn the Dublin backs uh, over. Yeah, and that was a big of part field. of Horan's first tenure of management yeah. was yeah, that massive on press yeah. again. Seventeen final, I remember particularly mm. when um, Jason Sherlock had to come onto the pitch to force clucks uh, to tell clucks and to go short all the time because yeah. Mayo were having such a press on the yeah. in the first half against yeah. Dublin. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and and it does make for more entertainment uh, football. It makes for again more enjoyment as a, as a, as a player that you are getting engaged with your uh, opponents very very quickly. And again, it is high risk football in, in ways. If you're the defence and you're getting turned over uh, inside your own 45 yard line, all of a sudden the opposition, because they have committed a few fellas forward for the press, it's, it's 6v6 as opposed to one forward versus six backs, yeah. which is what it, it, it kind of had been for a couple of years. For a good few. We're coming yeah. out of that because let's thank be God, honest, yeah. lads. Thank God. Because yeah. we, we all know, like, I mean, we analysed it on this show, we analysed it, but. And, and there used to be a nice clash of styles the odd time when a defensive team would meet an attacking team and there, there would be a counter-attack and counter, defensive football on the counter-attack did look good mm. it was exciting and the teams broke at pace but two defensive teams against each other like, Jesus yeah. some of those matches <laughs> they were desperate yeah, now honestly yeah. I, you, you would be on the couch and I know I'd have to analyse this 
the day after I'd take off my phone and flick through Twitter because yeah, I'd yeah. know there's going to be a minute of complete nonsense here and then someone will take on the chance to break a line it's like oh Christ mm. lad. if Ga- Gaelic football kept going like that lads honestly we chatter on the hurling show saying he used to love just randomly big GA man big Gaelic football man he says I, I don't watch it anymore it just does, doesn't interest me yeah. now he pr- yeah. it probably start interesting him again but it's Im- I think that's important too the bigger picture of the game well, yeah I, would, I wouldn't have said it on the show on Monday with uh, Conan and Kieran here but there was a couple of notorious old big games in Ulster that were like that as you said they were like oh, Jesus yeah. and these are showcase games showpiece games they were like Jesus this is what the game has become when you have a defensive team against a defensive yeah. team as opposed to a lot of games when those uh, you often say uh, and it's relevant to Gaelic football as well the styles make fights and, and, and those kind of different styles made for great games but it's glad now because I reserve judgement on for man until I see them like, yeah. <laughs> it's got, like whatever Shane McGullion is there saying they're still the lowest scorers I think in division two um, they're not like Galway obviously are on a different level to Fermanagh but like the the, the the evidence in the change in Galway is dramatic I mean they're scoring 220 something and like you know tearing the tearing the tearing the place apart against her own but like I'll, I'll wait till I see against Fermanagh but even if it didn't change Fermanagh Fermanagh that style of play is now the exception rather than the rule whereas yeah. a few years ago I think it was more becoming the rule than the exception yeah, it, the looks more, yeah. play like it, it looks outdated now doesn't it to yeah. be still doing that kind of thing I'm, I'm, it's funny that you, you're not fully believing for Manic because Jim McCrory I have to see them Jim, <laughs> Jim McCrory Jim McCrory doesn't believe them either he's obviously I think he's a system manager in Armagh um, he's uh, McGinney's right hand man he says the theory is that we're playing is that they're playing a bit more attacking style of football and are now more open but they'll probably go back to the usual 15 <laughs> behind the ball and that's hard to break down so he's not buying I it either McCurry camp for now until I see from Anna so we'll see McCurry yeah that's it like um, I mean look the way I look at it and I think every team should have more than one way of playing because if Leash are playing Dublin in Croke Park tomorrow do I want them to play the same way as if they're playing feckin Westmead who they can go at and take on if they're playing Dublin playing with a couple of sweepers out of nowhere it's not it's not wrong if you're a, if you're an underdog like I mean we all understand that the point I like the, obviously the, the trend that was going was that every team was playing with two sweepers in every bloody game well outside of Dublin who never Kerry played defensively for a little while under Fitzmaurice but then realised it's not it's not really mm. us um, you know it is the exception rather than the norm and, and, and look at says. and you are right you, you, you need a, a couple of options kind of in your um uh, in your gameplay, whether you are kicking the ball forward, if it's a slow play, that you are able to player in possession can make a decision to maybe come back and recycle and try to and try the far side. Um, I thought um, going back to the Dublin Donegal game briefly the weekend. Um, I think Donegal were so in, ingrained and maybe uh, in some ways to keep possession and avoid contact the whole time that when they actually got the ball in one on one positions in, in the Dublin full back line and. Um, inside our 30, 40 metre line they were still afraid to take fellas on yeah. mm. and they kept coming back and recycling that, tear Galway, loops. Galway, that yeah. tears my hair out Galway, honestly Galway, Galway yeah. aren't doing that and, and, and Dublin there was one year I think maybe I think it was 2015 I think where we did an awful lot of that uh, I know we won the All-Ireland against Kerry that year um, but um, there was real opportunities for the likes of Kieran Kilkenny and even Jack McCaffrey to take on it was a one-on-one like these yeah. guys are well able to take these guys on and create the overlap but it was nearly coached out of them in some ways to just protect the ball, keep possession. Yeah, yeah. after the Donegal semi final. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, Donegal are playing like that, and Donegal have better players um, uh, in the same way that like, Galway oh, have, have, have really good footballers, uh, as, as Tyrone do. And I remember that 2011 semi final against uh, Donegal. Um, like Michael Murphy was back in his full back line. And the, some of the forwards that they had, they were just all dropping back. Now, I know we nearly got cut out, but we did get over the line. We figured it out by the end. Or Kev Mack fi- figured it out by yeah, the yeah. end, getting a goal or that, but uh, a couple of points. But these guys are talented individuals. They're talented footballers. Push them up and let them take on their men yeah. if, if, if it is a one-on-one um, and, and show what they're all about. But uh, I, I thought they, were, they looked really, really coached, Donegal. And when they got the few points lead, uh, they probably cacked themselves a small bit. Yeah, and, uh, I'm going to ask Donald Keoghan yeah. about that because that's a criticism I have of Mead of yeah. actually giving a good ball into full forward line, having a one-on-one and, ha- and sending it back out to the 45 where you mm. came from. I can't yeah. comprehend yeah. it. Yeah. I just can't yeah. comprehend yeah. So you haven't given the ball away, but you've put yourself in a situation see, where you probably won't get a score. What's see, the point? You're, 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 What's the point of it? If I rub that for a second, Con- Connor, sorry, you're, you're after the game, uh, the stats go out <laughs> and <laughs> this is it. This is what yeah, you see yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and Connor. He had 10 possessions and he uh, kept the ball 10 times. Well done, Connor. He had 10 successful passes. 
But isn't, do you know that, what? isn't that so like you five one one v ones against your man like yeah um, you didn't yeah. score anything like so yeah and we often talk about <laughs> that the need for a qualitative analysis of these stats like do you know yeah. what I mean what, yeah. go, what good yeah. is completing 10 passes if you didn't you know if, if, the, if it led to Where nothing got, in the yeah. end you know what I mean as opposed to you yeah you took on your man five times you didn't beat him twice yeah. but you got three points the other way well that's it yeah. you know? so that's it so you, you you got one one out of five balls you lost three yeah. what would you yeah. take yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd take one one yeah. any day yeah. like without risk you won't get anything and that's yeah. like that it, it, that is a big thing but that's it I'm going to start putting a percentage on it because uh Galway right now are probably kicking maybe 70% hand pass and 30 like they're moving that ball fast their first instinct is that we want to move it down and kick it and beat the retreating players Donegal are still probably at like they're kicking more than what we remember them mm. but they're still probably about 70-30 mm, the other yeah, way yeah, which yeah. they need to I think you need to go 60-40 kicking hand passing like the hand passing doesn't work now and it's all because of the press on the kickouts mm. they're all doing it why would you work the ball up the field slowly and meet a pack defence when you can move the ball up the field really fast and get one on ones? Take yeah. how basic yeah. that sounds, lads. Isn't it? Is that not logical? Even go with hand passing is positive. <laughs> it <laughs> is. Oh, do you yeah. know, it's, it's very rarely lateral. You know, they might do a, like a 15 yard hand pass where it's just a too short of a distance to kick, but it's straight line. It's yeah. straight line yeah. towards yeah. the opposition goal. So, like, you could, while it, it mightn't, you know, correspond to your percentages for kick pass and hand passing, it's still really positive, which is the, obviously Park Joyce's philosophy. Whereas I thought I agree with Jer in Donegal, Dublin, that like, the the loop that Donegal do a lot and like Paddy McGuirty does a lot and does very well but it was nearly prescribed that they were going to do it beforehand anyways rather than adapting to the situation yeah. so like you know rather than somebody deciding whether it be McGuirty I wouldn't say Michael Murphy but like rather than take this guy on no we've worked on this loop so I'm going to do it anyway whereas there has to be you know adapting to the circumstances that you know happen during the game yeah well. no I completely agree I completely and uh, Kieran McKeever did make a good point on Monday saying that sometimes teams do it just for a breather I completely accept that yeah. there are times in a game we're slowing it down game management all those things relax lads relax and let's work a loop yeah. and yeah. we'll all get a breath there's that time for that the, the, but the, uh, I'm the signal for Dublin as well like you know for, you see Fenton doing yeah, stuff with his yeah. hands a lot isn't it it's maybe yeah. calm it down to calm it down for a little while give everyone a breather and then we work on a, a set and that makes it, but that training. can be within the 30% yeah, like yeah, they yeah. could still yeah. have the 70% <laughs> yeah. of kicking so I'm going to put a percentage on every team that I watch on what their percentage of hand passing to attacking play is would that be a good one now good. this is completely <laughs> estimated out of <laughs> <laughs> the one the one well, there's two what about uh, Galway Tyrone were on the weekend Dublin um, Dublin Donegal Donegal there's two decent games Donegal did 20% 80% I think against Dublin did too much long phase of possession yeah. and that was in the first half where they wouldn't really need the, br the breathers as much and I thought they got the easiest scores they got came off the kick passes so I think that's something they need to work on especially against Dublin because yeah. against Dublin more than anyone else Chair. That's what Dublin don't like. Yeah, Do you know, yeah, one on ones close to their goal. That's what the, no, well, no team, do, no team likes it. No, well, as a as a defender, do you want to be marking your man receiving the ball out in the forty five fifty or uh, marking him uh, inside your own twenty meter line and, and he has the ball? Like, like, what's more dangerous? And obviously, when the ball is inside and if it's, if it's kicked in fairly quickly, well, then you have to be on your toes as a uh, defensive unit. But uh, um, I certainly any of the Dublin teams I played on, we were always looking to kick the ball up as quick as possible um, uh, but we were able to adapt and evolve if, if we're playing against a defensive team and then we were able then on occasion then to let's, let's have a breather here let's just keep possession let's kind of reset the opposition may have got a couple of scores or got a goal in on us um, let's just kind of hold on to the ball take this thing out of their, yeah. their proper, proper patch a phase of possession would be no harm there listen we don't usually do tactical talk in part one I feel a bit weird <laughs> yeah. uh, doing it but uh, it's been done now anyways we'll come back with Donald Kyogen So Mead played Galway this Sunday in a must-win game and their captain Donald Keoghan joins us on the line now. Donald, how's it going? Not bad now, Willie, yourself? Not bad, not bad. I see you're being positive. You were saying that potentially four points might keep you up and six points will definitely do it. Yeah, I think, I suppose, going into the, the league, six was the was the target, I think, was kind of mostly, most teams on six in the previous years have stayed up. Uh, just the way it's gone with a couple of draws and it's been a tight fair. Um, you know, maybe potentially four might might keep you up, it might not. But um I suppose yeah, we're we're looking to, to gather a few points now from here on in. So it's starting with Galway now this weekend as you said in Nab and so it's an opportunity there for us to pick up points. But uh Galway, you know, obviously 
the team in form at the minute. They're really flying under Pork Joyce and stuff like that. So it'll be a tough test, but you know, we we'll welcome the snap and hope for the best. They're, they're all tough games in Division 1, Donald, and that's the thing. And what's probably the most frustrating thing for you is that you don't have your full team. Like, I mean, and you real, realistically, no, not disrespect, don't mean disres- disrespectfully, Mead need their full team to be able to compete in Division 1. Not compete, full, maybe yeah, not compete, injury. maybe not compete to win. Yeah, I suppose, look, the injuries kind of were kind of a few soft, mus- soft muscle uh, injuries, soft tissue injuries, another couple of other ones there that are kind of a little bit more serious and can be niggling at lads and they're taking the opportunity now, like you're wrong, you know, just to, to get them themselves right, which is perfectly acceptable on their own part. So I, I suppose in terms of the injuries, we can't really do anything about them at the minute because they just happened and I suppose that's the nature of the league with given the workload and given the the number and the volume of games, um, you know, you're going to pick up injuries along. Every team picks up injuries throughout the league. So that was, it is kind of, kind of it is what it is as such. So now, I suppose, instead of lamenting or kind of moaning over the, the loss of those lads, we just have to pick ourselves up and we have to, we have to keep going. And it, I suppose you could lament over it or you could see it, other lads can see it as an opportunity. I think that's what lads have done, like in, fair, in fairness to them. We've got a great bunch of character. Uh, we've got a good ca- character there in the squad. Really good lads that they've stepped up now, and they've, you know, number of key positions have been filled with lads that potentially wouldn't have had that opportunity without those um, unfortunate injuries to lads. So they put their hands up now for reckoning, and it's, it's up to the lads when they come back to get the spot back. But in the minutes, you know, we're very happy with the lads that have have stepped up and have filled those filled those gaps. They're really putting their their name forward. Yeah, and and uh, any of those injuries like Newman, Harron, Shane Walsh, all these fellas are de- these these aren't none of these are long term injuries, are they? They'll be back for come championship. Uh, I think that's the plan, yeah. I don't know the ins and outs of them exactly. That would be up to the medical team. But I think the, the, the plan is that hopefully, uh, potentially maybe even get a bit of time into them in the end of the league, depending on some of them, uh, for a few of them. But yeah, hopefully come championship, uh, it'd be great to have them back. Yeah. I wanted to ask you something tactically because I was the one game I saw you playing was against Donegal. And um, I saw a quote from you saying about Division 1. He said, if you get turned over in the final third or a shot, a shot drops short, it's instantly an opportunity for the other team to counter. I think that's where we were getting caught a lot. So we're working on that. We're working on our efficiency in front of goal, our shot taking, making sure you're taking the right shot or the right person is taking it. Are they lessons that you would have learned from the Super 8s potentially last year? Yeah, 100%. I think even you know, even as far back as the league final, um, you know, against Donegal, these are Division 1 teams that you're playing, Super 8, three Division 1 teams that you played. And I suppose we were granted that kind of, you know, it was great to get those three Division 1 games in the Super 8 last year as kind of almost, you know, to learn lessons that we need to learn uh, going forward. So it gave us an opportunity, bar, or instead of maybe the first three games of the league this year, learn your lessons there. It gave us an opportunity in the Super 8 last year to learn those lessons. And, I think we, we learned in those lessons that like often we're in the games at 50, 55 minutes to go and just the last kind of 15 minutes or last quarter, I'd say, that we kind of fade out of the, team, out of the games and I think we put that down to our our poor efficiency in front of goal, either, you know, our, our wide or dropping the ball short and ultimately at that level, teams are, are that good that they can, they can punch you off like scraps like that. So, even at the weekend there, you know, we hit a shot for uh, against Kerry. One, we took a shot and it dropped short into the keeper's hands and Kerry keeper's hands. They came back up the field and, and scored a goal off it. So, you know, there are the fine margins that you're talking about. It's it's, it's tough lessons to learn, but it's they're valuable at the same time. So it's something that we definitely learn from in Super Eight and even in our first four games, we're we're continually learning, learning. And as as a group of players as a squad, I think the lads are good enough to take messages on board. And we're we're just constantly trying to build on the, each performance the week previous. Right, because I, I, rem- I know from watching the Donegal game, there was a few occasions in the first half um, where you give a good ball in and whoever has it in the full forward line and there's a potential one-on-one and for whatever reason, they might kind of, you know, turn away from that one-on-one and pass it back and then suddenly it's passed back and it's back out to where it was kicked from. Do you know what I mean? There, there's a, there's a, a tendency yeah. for teams maybe to overdo not wanting to give it away, if you know what I mean. Yeah, that's possibly something that helps you know, us and we're trying to iron that out and try the uh, trainings in the previous couple of weeks and I think then again in Kerry there we kind of have brought that to a new level where we've kind of just got a little bit of confidence back. I think maybe confidence was an issue at the start of the league just you know, that's been a whole lot of game time in your first two games so lads are still kind of find their feet uh, no matter how much training you do you still can't replicate kind of a game situation so um, 
given that we've gotten four games now under our belt, I think, you know, lads are getting a bit more comfortable with themselves and taking the game on, the off and taking the man on, playing, you know, doing the right thing and just trusting themselves a bit better. Like, look, lads, we have good footballers in, in need there, so we just need to trust them. Well, that, well, that's the thing because it, it it it's it's difficult enough to give a good football pass in to the full forward line and get a ball in space. The last thing you want is for maybe you, who's given the foot pass, to get it maybe thirty seconds later again. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the thing, and we're we're constantly working on trying to trying to produce the finished article and trying to get that shot away in an area that is an advantage to us to like not to get the ball in and bring it back out and try to have to do it all over again. So. It's something that we're working on, yeah. Yeah. Do you think that, you know, the way Galway obviously have brought the kicking game to the fore this year and that's their their style of play. That's Mead's traditional style of play, I suppose. Like, I mean, I'm sure your players are very natural at doing that. That's always been the way Mead played. You, you've changed a little bit more to a running team like everybody else, you know, obvious, for obvious reasons, the way the game had gone. Yeah, I suppose Galway are playing a really nice brand of football. They're mixing many different aspects of the game. They're playing a nice uh, game of football. And I suppose, as you said, maybe it's something that was kind of representative of football maybe back a couple of years ago before maybe the defensive side of things came in. But it's always kind of resurrected. And I think a lot of teams nowadays are kind of adapting that free-flowing uh, approach. You see, like with Dublin, they're playing, again, a free-flowing uh, game. To, um, Kerry's, the Mayo's. They're all playing that free-flowing game, which has obviously been an advantage to them. I think Mead, we're, I suppose, we're trying to mix it. We're trying to use both or a number of different assets of the game. Of the game. We, run. we don't really tear ourselves down to one aspect or another. We just kind of, a lot of it is instinctive. It's decided by the man on the ball, what he does with it. So it's kind of, we're allowed that freedom by the management to kind of express ourselves and do what we want kind of in terms of attacking we don't really have a structure in place like so it's very much down to the man on the ball very much then I suppose we were talking on the show we were laughing Ger Brennan was talking about maybe players getting stats after the game and you know gi- being given the stats you gave the ball away three times and somebody else didn't give it away and then we were saying what about the fellow who gave it away what was he trying to do and what was the other fellow trying to do you know what I mean sometimes the stats don't paint a picture of what you know a, an offensive yeah. player trying a difficult pass rather than somebody else playing it safe yeah, you can look like I suppose stats on the page are very different to the game in real time, like you know that way. So as you said, a lad giving the ball away, well his t- intentions were to get the game the game going or get the ball moving. Uh, I think, you know, it's it's important that you do marry the two. You, obviously stats are important in the modern game, but you also have to look at the real time picture and see what was what was going on at the time or what were the options even at the time. You know, sometimes a lad has no option and his only option is to potentially try a fifty fifty ball or a a non kind of you know not advantageous ball, so that's obviously going to come with some risk. So, yeah, there there is there is that aspect. But I thought is that you you uh, feedback constructively with that with those data and you use that data to your to your advantage and not kind of put preventions on lads or don't prevent them doing something that they they would naturally do just because they're worried about a stat at the end of the day. I think that can that can also hamper lads if, if they're too worried about the, the many balls they're giving away or. Her, many tackles and then sometimes it becomes a bit of a burden on lads so it's all about making lads sure lads are that they have the confidence from the management to do and express themselves which is, is really important I think Yeah no exactly Come here you were around since 2012 Banty gave you your debut Jeez, if people remember back to Banty over Mead it seems like a long time ago um, right now but it's been a fair roller coaster for you hasn't it like I mean you've been relegated down to Division 3 in your time you've had two All-Star nominations you've had Leinster final appearances now you're now in Division 1 you've done you've done the whole tour doll in, in the time you've played for Mead Yeah it's been a good uh been a good mix of a few highs, a few lows, but I think that's all part and parcel of the the game. I don't think you know, I wouldn't. I, I've enjoyed every year so far, and it's continue, I'm continuously enjoying it as well. So long may it last. But yeah, I think that's part and parcel of the game. Like it's obviously nothing's going to stay at the one level forever. You go up some days, you go up down some days. So it's it's just about you know. I, I think personally, I just take it kind of match for match and <clears throat> week to week. So it's just about enjoying it and the living it in the real time. I suppose you don't know what around the corner or what what could come around and you know, hamper your, your progression next so I think all about enjoying it, I think enjoying uh, living I'm, in the moment I'm sure you're enjoying it a lot more out of, in the half back line than you were following fellas around as a cornerback <laughs> yeah, as I said previously like a lot of my football underage would have been 
in the half back line. I played a lot with Kenny in centre back and wing back, so it's probably an area that I was more probably comfortable than perhaps playing in the full back line. So you, you do get on a bit more ball out there and you've a chance to express yourself a bit better, yeah. So it's, it's, it's enjoyable, yeah. Very enjoyable. Well, that's interesting you say that you played a lot of underage at wing back because you, you I was reading that you didn't play with the minors, you were a sub on the on the mead minors. Is that right? There's always examples of this which yeah, I find so very interesting. Yes, yeah, when I say underage, I mean like my club like underage or whatever. Yeah, okay. I didn't play I didn't play much with Mead. Um I played nothing with Mead underage in terms of like under fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. It was only until minor I was brought in. Um I club in uh Barney Allen, who's chairman and Eddie Value kinda <laughs> persuaded me to go in there to club mates of mine. They said those trials on for, for Mead minor, so I wasn't gonna go and then And what did you 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 didn't want to ha- you didn't want to go, is that it you weren't pushed? Uh, at the time I, I at the time, it wasn't. I suppose maybe I don't know. What it was I just didn't have? I didn't think maybe up to that level or something. So I was kind of yeah. really, you know, hesitant enough to go in, sort of thing. But they were. I suppose they had the confidence in me to say to go in, make sure you go in, and have a go. So I went in anyway and um, got on the panel then for the minors. But I uh, didn't didn't play much. Didn't see much action there. Yeah. Um, we got knocked out early, so I suppose it wasn't, <laughs> wasn't a great role. Ever since then, then I've kind of yeah been knocking around. Me set up so under the ones as and um and then onto the field. So so where would the bi- where did the big improvement in your game come then? The two years you played under twenty one before two thousand you made your debut in two thousand and twelve, or did two thousand and twelve just lift you into a different kind of place form wise? Uh, I suppose I've been knocking around kind of panels and extended panels um for a number of years, kind of before twenty twelve, kind of from nearly 2010 on, which would be my two years in in the under 21s. Uh, Eamon O'Brien, who was the manager at the time of Mead, that he won the the Leinster final there with Mead. He actually set up a kind of like a provisional uh, development squad. So um, he kind of picked young lads maybe coming to the ranks that would have been maybe shown potential. So from the minor panels and stuff like that. So even myself and Mickey Newman, Dunica Tobin. Uh, Mark Collins, a few of us there who would have been played senior football, we would have all been on that kind of group together. Um, and he kind of was the one put in place then, like, you know, early gym programs and a bit of conditioning work for us that that we could use then going forward. And then if he was stuck for, say, a number for an in-house game, he'd often bring and give us a bit of time, which was nice to kind of drift PJ into the exposure in the senior setup. Yeah. And then it kind of, that was, it was going from kind of, you know, it was a gradual increase then into your load. So, so maybe you see nowadays sometimes lads come in from under twenties or under nineteen and they're coming into senior panels and they're maybe just not used to the workload and they kind of the bodies often break down the first couple of years until they get used to it. So I suppose aiming with the development and the hindsight of or the foresight that he had, he set up these development panels and uh, it was kind of a nice opportunity to just to creep the load up a little bit on us and get us a little bit conditioned in that vital stage of you know when you're nineteen twenty when you're you're developing a bit better. And you can kind of withstand the higher load that so he did it in a structured way that was not not going to overbear you, but it was preparing you for potentially something that's going to come down the line with me. Like so, he was very he had a good foresight there, and he actually a lot of us in that development squad did progress onto um, the meet team, so it was it was good. And then obviously, as I said, he could he could tap into it if you want was stuck for numbers in, a, in his game or something, which kind of gave you a little bit of a bit of drip feed. Uh, into the setup, so it was really good actually. Yeah, no, it definitely sounds good. So, like, I mean, I don't want to put a, a, you know, a dampener on things, but you've lost seven games in a row. And we we often talk about this on the hurling show with counties that are trying to make the step up to the next level. Is the experience you've gained from those seven losses does that outweigh? Is that better than the momentum you would gain from being in Division Two and winning seven games, for example? Yeah, I'd be a big believer, and I suppose the whole setup and management are a big believer in that. The lessons we learned in those seven games, it has to like it definitely has to stand to us in the long term. So, like the example that Andy gave, like you know, if you look at potentially the the share price and a big company like Facebook, I think it was up in a straight line. He always says so. There's there's always troughs and there's always dips and what's done in life and every even like share prices in teams form or whatever, but. I think the overarching uh, the trend or in our in our kind of performances is that we're getting better. And as a result of those seven games, I know obviously as you said, seven losses in a row, but I think there's definitely we've learned so many lessons and we're like we're definitely a better team now. As I said previously, this time last year no one on the team had division one experience at all. So now we have, you know, twenty six, twenty third, twenty eight, whatever the whatever the number is, a lot of lads that have played division one football and have experienced that level 
of speed and actually the opposition like so it, it's definitely definitely going to stand to us um, not like, yeah you need to try to get a few results but as, as we said if our performance keeps improving the results hopefully can look after themselves that's brilliant Donald thanks very much for taking the call I won't waste any more of your time I'll let you back to work So a little bit of analysis, lads, and I suppose the big one of the weekend, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm the important one because I produced the show, is Mayo and Kerry. Um, <laughs> Not going to disagree with you there. That's you? on Saturday night. This is on Air Sport, and it's on RT2 as well. And, like, I mean, I don't know, we've talked about a lot of teams. We haven't really focused all that much on Mayo. Um, James Horan said after the last game, he says, we're looking at winning games, we're looking at playing well, and we haven't played well yet, and we want to try and get a good performance. This is, he's talking after the Monaghan game. And you know, I think Mayo were in that for a long, a long part of the game. Like even Stephen Cohen had a the mark that he missed, kind of tamely to say yeah. the least. And you know, they kind of fell apart after the second, or after the red card. But like, I mean, if the reality is Mayo are on three points and they're lucky to have the three points. Yeah, completely. I mean, we we're absolutely. They could be on zero points. Yeah, we were blessed to get the uh, the last minute goal by James Durkin in uh, in Valley Buffet, and then uh, against Mead. Uh, Mead probably should have won that game, especially after getting two. It was goals. a late McLaughlin goal. Yeah, really, get right? two goals against the Breeze in the second half, and even uh, even Kevin McLaughlin's goal came out of a mistake by the Mead corner back, pounced on by McLaughlin, gave it to Ryan O'Donoghue, gave it back yeah. to him, and got the goal, which was crucial at the time. So absolutely blessed to get those points. And like, even though you say we were in it, and we were in it until let's say Jordan Flynn got sent off, I always had the nagging feeling throughout the game the Monaghan were just getting scores easier the Monaghan were going to go on to win that game I would have been very shocked if Mayo went on to win it that's Mayo with 15 and then Park O'Hara got sent off at the end 9 points was a bit much but I thought Monaghan were the better team just as a Mayo fan like obviously worried like Mayo <laughs> last year was a relief because we weren't in this situation because we started the league so well first year in a long time the relegation wasn't a big threat but like we're, we're kind of used to this but like I fear for Mayo more this year than I do for other years because First of all, the, the players that we have coming back are a while away from coming back, I think, and these are crucial players to Mayo. But I think Donald Vaughan and Killian O'Connor are close to coming close, back. I, I think James Horne said about them that it's a matter of days, so whether they're going to be involved against uh, Kerry, I haven't seen the team yet, I'm not sure. But even if they do come back, they're coming back in you know, after Killian O'Connor, definitely, and uh, Donny Vaughan as well, out for fairly long spells with injuries, so whether they'll be able to adapt to that immediately, I don't know. And then, as well as that, then, it's like, it's like Mayo are nearly struggling for an idea identity crisis we've uh, young players coming through but they're probably not at the level yet the the, the lads that are the experienced lads that are coming back they're probably only they're not at full tilt yet they're used to peaking for the championship so but it's come to a stage now where we need results and uh you know Kerry this weekend I'm not sure I think the big one for Mayo is going to be Tyrone in a couple of weeks time depending on how results go but yeah I think we've managed to dig it out you know dig it out when when it didn't look like it in recent years but I don't know this could be the year that, 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 that I hope not but that Mayo could go down it's the first time in 25 years or something They're like the that. longest serving yeah. Division 1 uh, team I think they did it they avoided relegation in 17 and 18 Kevin McLaughlin on both occasions so he had a late point against Tyrone to beat them and stay up and a late point against Donegal to draw and stay up there was always a feeling in those years though Jared, that you know Mayo are timing their run you know, they're, they're maybe a team that has a few miles on the clock and, you know it, they're focusing on more the championship than the league this time there's a feeling that they're trying out a lot of young lads. They're not. They're, they don't seem to be up to that standard of the players that aren't there. And a bit like Mead, don't May, Mayo now don't have the squad to deal with players being out and stay be a division. A, a, you yeah. know, a top division one team. I suppose but the bar that Mayo are kind of working towards uh, again is trying to win in All Ireland because they've been so close over the the last number of years, uh, winning the National League last year, uh, set up great hopes for them again. Um, I think for me, Connor, I know you're uh, as a Mayo guy, but <laughs> so, some of the trusted lieutenants um, just haven't been able to cut it um, in the big games. And again, there's only fine margins between the squads. And maybe James Horn, he, he, in his head with the management team, it's a case of I, I need to have a look at as many players as possible give them as much game time as possible and um, if that means going down this year which I'm sure he's not um, he, he, nobody wants to go down but uh, if that gives us better experience or exposure of these young players for the next two to three years as opposed to going with the same guys who have gotten them so far maybe that's what he's doing and uh, he's he's kind of happy to do that but 
uh, come the championship, I'm sure Horn's ego and more than our own egos are involved with the team and the pressure comes on, he probably will go back to I think a lot of the same. Oh, he has to, and like I mean, the guys are they're doing all right. Some of them, like you know, but they're 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 just not kind of cutting it. Like, you know. Yeah, but just just on that, but like you, we've mentioned before as well, it's different. If you're a young lad coming into like an established team with mm. maybe 13 players that you're kind of that that they're used to playing for Mayo for years. It's it's different to trying to make an impression when you're coming into a team with that that is seven or eight young fellas, and James Horn has been kind of forced into this because, as I said, these lads are not back from the the more established lads are not back from injury yet. So while I'm sure he wanted to blood them anyway, mm-hmm. he's, he's he's been left with little choice because there's nobody else available because these lads aren't ready to come back yet. So that's why like it, it's been there's been flashes, there's been glimpses from the likes of Tommy Conroy from Ryan O'Donoghue, but they're but they're playing in a team that's struggling as well. So it's not necessarily doing yeah, them justice yeah, either. Yeah. That's um, true. Yeah. But uh, but that, that that's 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 the way it's going to have to be until these lads are going to going to come back. It's going to be these lads that uh, James Horn is going to have to rely on to get these results. And I hope, but I, I have my doubts about whether they're going to be able to do that in the coming weeks. Yeah. So like I mean, it it is very easy <coughs> to do maybe like a Pat Spillan on it and say Mayo are finished and there everybody you, you could have a. Like there was people doing that in seventeen and eighteen or sixteen and seventeen when yeah, they ended up yeah. nearly beating Dublin because of the league and like Donald Vaughan's out, Killian O'Connor's out, Brendan Harrison's out, Seamus O'Shea's out, Chris Barris is out, Chris Barrett is out, Fionn McDonough's out, Jason Doherty's out, Matthew Ruan's out. Like what many is that? One, two, three, four, five, eight. six. Mm-hmm. That's eight. Colin Boyle. Star- that's eight starters. Colin Boyle's long term, so mm-hmm. he's out for the year. Like I, I'm Probably. talking about. Probably I'm talking about lads that potentially could be back mm. in the summer. That's eight. That's that's eight out of fourteen outfield players. That are, all them are guaranteed starters. You'd say Phil McDonough maybe, but you'd imagine after last year he's a he's, he's he'll start wing forward. They're nowhere near full strength. Yeah, and 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 and, and Horn, I'm sure, isn't worried, and maybe it is, uh, given the injuries that are there, that it is less pressure than, or he feels less pressure with some of the results because. Anybody who knows Mayo football will, will 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 know that well we have these eight guys and obviously Colin Boy and long term injury out of action so we won't worry about it just yet and if we get these lads back towards the end of the national league um, and certainly by the first uh, round of the Connacht championship that we'd be in the mix again and uh, so maybe that's what Horns thinking though uh, too the great thing about Mayo Woolley and the example you gave there is that those lads love playing championship football and. And we've all talked out for a league game and we've all talked out for a championship game where there's Clover County. And there's always a different buzz uh, going to that game and there's a bit more adrenaline going and you, and you do get yourself up for it. And those, uh, th- that, that Mayo team, the players you mentioned, have a huge experience at performing um, and certainly getting to the latter stage of the championship. So hope is not a loss, but for me, I think some of those guys, are they going to start? Yeah, but have they all been able to cut the mustard in the latter stages of the all Ireland finals which very very close in terms of uh, winning and losing the fine margins and there's been draws and there's, there's been uh, one point losses and um, I just think of Donald Vaughan when he went in mm, and yeah, yeah, but he gave won. John Small a push and uh, stuff like that and I was you know I should have a list of hard luck stories you don't have a list of hard luck stories but, 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 uh, but, but the point is uh, I, I'm making is that um, these guys have, have, have done extremely um great work and given an awful lot of great service and I'm sure they'll continue to do what they can it's interesting that you say that to make it. what a fellow on Twitter uh, said this to me uh, today he said that Dublin's slow starts um, are probably due to the fact that their last big game in Croke Park was the All-Ireland Final and now they're playing games in Croke Park with 20,000 in it mm. like it must be a terrible come down from them to come from last year's championship five in a row to now a, a ground where they can hear each other shouting and you know there's no buzz around the game they obviously did a, did a good start against Kerry in the first one because it was a repeat of that all Ireland you know and now yeah. you've had three bad starts in a row would there be anything of that to that in it what is it weird yeah. for you having normally would you would have been packed usually when you played there yeah. and then again I suppose your league games got better crowds as well but there obviously would have been some league games where it would be weird that you could actually hear yourself talking I d- was it was it as well 2010 where, where um, uh, Joe Sheridan got the try to, to beat Louth yeah, in the yeah. final <laughs> yeah. me, me, me put five uh, goals Pasty, on yeah. us yeah, in the semi-final and I was on the hill that day hey, trying, yeah. to, trying to stop smiling. Is that, is that you, were, <laughs> you were pulling any moonies around. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought that was you, yeah. Small fella, yeah. <laughs> but uh, we, we went through the back door and we played, actually played Armagh, um, won the back uh, the Tip hours, as well, no? And we played Tip 
and the tip game, I think there was like 18,000 or something came up on the screen and that was a weird experience. Uh, but again, because it's such a huge mecca that it yeah. can become quite eerie. But uh, I don't know. It's a, it's a fair point, probably, Wally, but um, I don't know. It probably gets in on the guys too much. Um, I think they've just been starting the league poorly, uh, bar the Kerry game that you mentioned. Right. You know? Okay, maybe fair enough. So do, what do, we, we talked about Lee Keegan. What's your thoughts on Lee Keegan, Connor? Is this just a matter of, like, Chris Barrett comes back, plays cornerback, although Lee Keegan did mark Connor Callaghan. Mm. My thoughts on it, what happened Lee Keegan that suddenly he's been turned in from being the best wing attacking wing back in the country with Jack McCaffrey, a player of the year. Then Rutford start using him to mark uh, Enda Smith, which made sense in midfield. Then suddenly he's back in marking Quinn Liven at full back. Mm. Now he's an orthodox cornerback. This is, the, <laughs> this is one of Mayo's greatest weapons, best players ever. And now he's... A cornerback, <laughs> like I yeah. say, opposition teams just cannot believe this. Or, like I was thinking, when Chris Bauer comes back, Grand he'll go out b- back wing back, or maybe he's struggling for form at wing back. Let him play himself back into form. Like it's Lee Keegan, he's going to come back into form. I'd like to think that'll happen eventually. I mean, when I saw him name cornerback at the weekend, I thought it was a plan to go on what he's done with mixed success in in recent years. If you, if you definitely go back to the Conor Callaghan um, situation last year, but I thought he was there to mark Conor McManus, which I wouldn't necessarily have recommended myself. But that's that's why I was maybe able to accept the logic. He wasn't even doing that. But he's not a good, he's not he's no, not no, a good I, man I, I, marker. I, I, no, I agree. I agree. Like I'd have Lee Keegan number five all day. I think just that's his best position. And the most annoying thing for me about the Monaghan game was that um, something I hadn't seen from Lee Keegan in a while. And and this goes back to because probably he, the last time he would have done it would have been last summer. But he was actually making those typical kind of Lee Keegan runs. But he was making them from so deep that yeah. by the time he got to, like he, he was kind of reaching his peak around half the halfway instead of getting on, you know, maybe around the 65 and being able to kick kick a point at the 45 yard line. So like it was a waste of his, it was a waste of his kind of um, his strengths there. So like I like to think that I like, come the summer when Chris Barrett is back. I, I, my, 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 my thinking as well is that Brendan Harrison wasn't playing against Manon either. Yeah. So um, James Horn is looking at a full back line with Oshin Mullen who's new. Park O'Hora has only really started this year as well that he needed some experience back there as well. That's why he put Lee Keegan back So you're there. looking at Harrison, you're looking at Mullen, you're looking at Chris Barrett as your first choice full back line given uh, given Oshie Mullen's performances yeah I know it's only the league but he's been very impressive yeah Yeah, and you have to and then you're looking at Lee Keegan you're looking at Durkin on the other side and you're looking at a choice of centre half six is a six is a big issue for me at the yeah. moment yeah because I don't think I don't think that Lee Keegan or Paddy Durkin are natural centre backs and I think you want them at five and seven um, Michael Plunkett um, I'm not sure yet I mean he started he was he started against Ross Common last year in the championship it didn't go well from he didn't really play six after that he's been the number six for the league so far um, probably hasn't done enough to convince so and with Colin Boyle now out for probably the season I don't know. Is he going to persist with him there? Maybe it's I mean, maybe Cohen it's is an option at six. Is he? You'd well, had you him. See, in, you yeah, see, because Cohen is Cohen has been named in midfield, but he's been, I think because Jeremy O'Connor then has been dropping back, and then then you see the thing is my thing as well is that Mayo don't have enough physicality in attack at the moment. So ideally, you'd have Aidan O'Shea up there, but Mayo at the moment can't afford not to have Aidan O'Shea in midfield. Yeah. So in well, an no, I, when Rowan comes back, for me, Aidan O'Shea. Ha- he has to play up front for me. Yeah, I, I he just th- has to. I think so too. I think so. Um, so far away is Rowan away. He's he, James Warren actually did an interview with the Mayo News podcast this week, and he said that Matthew Rowan is only a few weeks away, a couple of weeks away. Could yeah. play by the end of the league. He took a big knock in the um, Sigerson. He was playing for NUIG. Right. And like and and Rowan gives just that that um, a, a level of athleticism yeah. as well. Like he was yeah. really impressive last year in championship as well as league. So ideally, when Matthew Rowan comes back, he's a partner in midfield. Aidan O'Shea goes back to uh, centre forward, I would imagine, and Stephen Cohen comes in at six. But that's 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 you know uh, hypothetically that everybody everybody is fit to play there. But that's that's not going to be the situation for a few weeks you're still going to have Aidan O'Shea midfield probably with Jeremy O'Connor and Lee Keegan could although I agree with you that I don't want him there could end up playing in the full back line right. because it's, the lads aren't ready to come back it's, yet it's, it's a totally different sport playing in the full back line and the half back line it's like ah, two yeah. different games yeah. uh, and the few times got thrown in there it's rotten like if you're not built for it yeah. the full backs like they're different fellas like they're just muckers and just get a hand on and that's well, the pri- wants, you know? one thing that I, I, I think, did I read Rio Ferdinand's book? Well, I read a passage out of it anyways. And he played centre forward as a young fella, right up through mm. the underage ranks. And then he went back at centre back and he said at the start he hated it. He couldn't understand it. And it took about three or four seasons for him to actually start priding himself on a clean sheet and for mm. his psychology to go from being the hero, what he used to 
we all kind of want to play football and yeah. get on maybe as an attack and half back get up yeah. get a score yeah. influence the game yeah. when you're a cornerback you have a whole other set of, of, of priorities, target yeah. priorities and they're not influencing the game yeah. they're just focused on one person it's like a totally different ball game mentally yeah. Yeah. do you know what I mean it's like did, what did they dream about the night before the game it's just <laughs> literally this fella yeah. whereas in, in the other positions of the field you're dreaming about being all over the place yeah, and you yeah. know getting involved yeah. and they're, the psychology of a cornerback is it's it's basic enough. Stop yeah. your. <laughs> like. Oh no, don't know the great line you referenced it here oh, yeah. a couple of times about making corner forwards life's misery or something like that, and that has to be the mentality of a lot of cornerbacks. You yeah. you will have like the way the Galway are playing at the moment. You'll have a Johnny Heaney that you know can get on the end of a you know move and get a goal or whatever. But there has to be you have to have lads in your team that will pre- are prepared to have that mentality. I'm the same. Like I. Little between cornerback and and uh, the halfback line. I hate the fullback yeah. line. It's completely different, <laughs> yeah. and I I don't understand the mentality of people who enjoy it. But there are people out there who <laughs> yeah. do. Yeah, you and just made we, to be converted back there is very difficult. To, yeah, to cornerback. Like Johnny Cooper is a big one that stands to mind. Like yeah. being a kind of a, a football in halfback, yeah. to turning himself. Now well, I suppose he just did, he just took off up the field, <laughs> maybe to break the you know yeah. not to be completely cold turkey cornerback. It, and it's also the way a team set up against Dublin where they're conceding the whole time. So. Yeah, so you'll get up the field yeah. at some stage yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I think I said a couple of weeks ago but I, Johnny got injured in, in the warm up uh, against Throne the National League maybe 2013 or 14 and um, uh, I got put in full back on Stephen O'Neill I think it was 2013 uh, playing they were playing Throne were playing to the hill and I, I was really really tight on him like you know I, I, I thought he was and he got four balls and he got four points and about half a yard and I was like, this is rotten. Like, yeah. you know, but it's yeah, runs yeah. where when you're out the field, you're always kind of getting a push on the guy, you're getting a push on him. And um, the runs, they're not kind of five yard little darts kind of behind you. They're a bit longer, 20, yeah. 30 yards. So you can kind of read them a bit better and get yourself between the man and the ball. Whereas in full back line, it's the five, 10 yard hand pass and your man is just sprinting a couple of yards. It's trying to kind of read that. As, as, as That's far a hard one. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. it, and as well, we, we've said this on the show a good few times. If you're a half back and you're close to your man, they won't give him the ball. Yeah. If you're on the full back line and you're close to the man, he's getting it. Yeah, and he, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, he's yeah, getting it. Yeah, so, you, yeah. like, you know, like often a turn off for a half forward is just having his man near him. Yeah. Do you know? Because yeah, you're yeah. like, I'm not going to. That's a bit risky out here or whatever. But the full forward, for some reason, even if he's half a yard, he's getting it anyways. That's yeah. just kind of the tradition. Right. The other games, lads, we'll have to we'll have to wrap it up here. Um, big one in, in Division 2 is Leash and Kildare Leash could put Kildare in terrible trouble that's in a more park at 7 o'clock big local derby um, um, in that one we know Kildare in an awful run it would be lads you know the, whole, the old saying too good to go down mm. although Kieran McKeever doesn't have too much good to, you don't have too much good things to say about Kildare either I've, I, I kind of believe in Kildare a little bit maybe a little bit too much based on you and Kieran McKeever's analysis <laughs> of them. Well, I, the, lovely footballers they're well able to kick past the ball um, if it was a skill session or something like that or skills competition you know to be right up there yeah. but when it comes you're, to you don't mean that as a compliment you mean that as an insult right yeah but fair enough I yeah. do but, 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 uh, <laughs> but, but, but their, their, their uh, individual uh, abilities does not transfer to the team for whatever reasons and I just don't know I'm not obviously from there I went to college in Minute. You, you did a few years in Minute, did you? I did, did three years, years Minute, there, so yeah. you, you get to know a few lads uh, oh lovely fellas but uh, there's something that happens maybe it's the group mentality that maybe they think they're better than what they are I'm they need maybe a Kieran McKeever or not a Kieran McKeever, Kieran McGinney style older fella, real leader to whip them all into shape or something yeah. that they might be afraid of or something. Yeah, like and, and for, uh, Jack O'Connor's brought a, a couple of guys back in again, uh, fellas who kind of drifted, but uh, they're, 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 they're still not kind of cutting the mustard. And I think we all predict this, uh, if I'm wrong, Connor Kildare to be most common. Uh, yeah, and I predict him to week. go up as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah um, me too. And I predict Mayo to get to the league final. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? Very brutal. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I'll replay. Why, why I'll are we re- on the show? <laughs> I'll, re- I'll replay all those predictions yeah, yeah. Uh, when the league's over, lads. Uh, Awfully Down is a big one in Division 3, as far as I'm concerned. They're both on five points. Um, long for play Tipperary which is a pretty big one um, in that as well listen that's all we've time for um, we'll be back we might do something on Division 3 teams uh, next Thursday um, we'll talk to you next Monday where we'll review everything we'll talk to you then good luck